Uh, one of the thematics I want to do today in our discussion, because I know it's important to you, is to talk a bit about family. Uh, you did start your firm with your sister, which I think is awesome. Um, but before we get there, uh, I think it's the case that if it wasn't for your mom, you'd be a UPS truck driver. Yes. Why? Oh, sorry. No, no, like you're just supposed to do it. Oh, okay, okay. got it. Um, yeah, when I was in college, um, you know, if you have a Jewish mom, you end up either being a lawyer or a doctor. And um, I'd gotten this great job uh, working at UPS as a truck driver, and I remember um, I told my mother, hey, I think, I'm, I think I could make a career out of this. I think I could actually get into management. So I'm not gonna go to law school. And um, you know, my mother looked at me and said, look, you can do whatever you want, um, but it's not your life. So, <laughs> um, you're going to law school. And I was like, no, 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 this is really what I want to do. And she goes, I really don't care. Uh, your father and I came here from Morocco and we didn't come here for you to be a truck driver. Um, so, you know, I said, well, that's really what I want to do. And she goes, do it after law school. And um, so, went off to law school and then clerked for a job, uh, for a judge and um, forgot all about working at UPS. But now they're an investor, so it's actually all good. It comes full circle. So uh, you co-founded with your sister Avenue Capital in 1995 uh, with only about seven million. Now the firm manages around 10. Um, how did you make the transition from being a lawyer, as he mentioned, I'm also a recovering attorney as well, to go from doing that into running money and running one of the biggest hedge funds out there? How does that happen? Um, I think I, I thought I'd be a tax lawyer because I was always um, pretty good at math. And I ended up clerking for a judge and then worked. Um, I practiced law for about a year and then got out and went to work at a small investment firm where I started managing money for them um, without any experience. So that was actually kind of fun. Um, and made the firm about $25 million and um, ended up getting a bonus of about $10,000. So quickly realized time to move on and go off on my own. And when we um, started Avenue, I'd worked for the Bass family, the Bass brothers had managed money for them. And we started with our capital and that of the Bass family. And then um, I think within five years, we were running about a billion dollars. And then five years later, we were running about $25 billion. And we had grown pretty quickly and about five years ago, gave back half the money, just thought um, it was too much money to manage. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit, you know, when you, uh, I think as people before spoke about it, um, you've got to decide, do you want to be an investor or do you want to be an asset manager? And if you want to be an investor, you've got to find sort of areas where you can invest and it's hard to do with larger amounts of capital. Also, since I'm the largest investor in the fund, um, I wanted to make money on my capital, so thought um, it was better to return that capital. You're what's called a distressed investor, so that's a bit different of a perspective than most <laughs> people commonly associate with investing. So, you know, typically people look for good companies without problems to invest in. You do the opposite, you look for problems. So explain that, because that's kind of maybe a stranger thing and maybe means you're a bit strange, so how, how does that work? Um, look, a lot of it, ends up being we want to buy when everybody wants to sell, right? So you, I think you're getting overpaid because people just get nervous. When, any, when anything goes down, everybody gets nervous about it. And so we try to do a lot of work and it's really all, there's always a special situation, right? There's always a reason why something's going down. If you think about, a great example is like 2008. In 2008, we were buying Ford bank debt. So, uh, you guys have Fords out here, right? right? It's, a, it's a car, it's a big car company. And at the time, there was about $10 billion of senior secured bank debt. So, all we had to do as we did all our work was come to the conclusion that Ford itself would be worth more than $10 billion. Right? And you'd get paid off. So, um, you know, it, it sounds ridiculous to say today, but back then everybody thought all these companies were going into bankruptcy. So we start buying the debt, and we start buying the debt around 70 cents on the dollar. 
um, saying the company can't, you know, as long as it's worth more than seven billion, we're not going to lose money. And we keep buying, and we keep buying it, and it becomes literally our largest position. And the bank that goes from 70, 60, 50 cents, and we have about um, close to, you know, I would say a billion face of this bank debt, uh, which is, you know, the cost was around half a billion dollars, and at the time we're running um, around 20 billion plus. So I remember I'm sitting on the trading floor, and um, you know, the trader says to me, Look, there's another 50 million. Do you want to buy it? I'm like, no. It's, every time we buy, it just goes down. I'm sick and tired of owning this thing. And you know, the analyst and the portfolio manager who are right next to me go, look, Mark, um, I really think we should buy it. And I'm like, I know, but you've been saying that all the way down. And nothing personal. We've lost hundreds of millions of dollars on your idea. <laughs> And I'm really not listening to you anymore. <laughs> um, so the trader looks at me. You know, he's a little. He, normally, I don't really get that upset. So uh, he goes, "What do you want to do?" I said, "I don't want to own this thing." And the portfolio manager says, "I really want to own it." I'm like, "I don't care." Um, and I look at the trader and I say to him, "Look, just bid him thirty cents," because we had we had talked to him and I said, "Just bid 30. And he goes, "Well, we'll never buy it." I go. Hence why I said, let's bid 30 cents. <laughs> and um, you know, the trader then says, okay, well, thank you very much. I go, why are you thanking him? He goes, we just bought it at 30 cents. And you know, I look at the PM and the analyst, and you know, I think I'm insane at this moment because all that did was buying that at 30 meant we were marking down our billion <laughs> another 20 points, which meant in that split second, on a market standpoint, we had just lost another $200 million. Um, so I look at the portfolio manager and the analyst, and I said, seriously, I think I'm going to kill you guys. <laughs> and, and the uh, analyst says, I'll be right back. I go, where are you going? He goes, before you fire me, <laughs> I just want to call my wife to tell her I'm out of a job. <laughs> and I said, well, hurry up. <laughs> um, and look, you could, I didn't fire them, um, and but that story talks about how everybody just got more nervous, more nervous. We kept buying. Um, thank God that was the last purchase, and we sold all of our Ford bank debt at 105. So, you know, the 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 story is really look when things are going down, it's really easy to say buy. Right? But I'm telling you, when it goes you know, when it goes down 10 points, it's okay. You think. I'm right. But when the market is telling you and you've bought a billion dollars of paper and every time you buy it, it just keeps going lower, it's not a good feeling. And so not only do you have to be certain in what you're doing, but you have to have the time to do it. And I think um, it, you know, what 2008 and sort of crises show you is when people act irrationally, that's actually when you want to buy, but it's the hardest time to buy. Yeah, which means you, you need duration of capital, and you started yes. to kind of address some of this at the outset. Um, I just want to hone in on another thing you started to talk about, which is the characteristics it takes to invest in this manner, uh, maybe from an individual standpoint. So I've done this with our mutual friend, Jim Chanos, who says that there's a particular type of person who becomes a short seller. Is there a particular type of person who becomes a distressed investor that you can uh, generalize? I, I don't know. I think, I think most investors have to believe they're right, right? Because just think of it this way. Every time you buy a stock, the person who's selling it thinks it's going down, right? The person who's buying it thinks it's going up. So to be a really successful investor, you've got to constantly be buying when other people are selling. Um, so I think to be a distressed investor, you're, um, I think you just have to be able to weather those times. You know, I, I've tried to explain this to my mother, who... Um, <laughs> It's like a nightmare trying to explain to her. She doesn't understand why I'm still not a lawyer. <laughs> uh, but it's, you know, what I try to do is I say, look, mom, what I do is I buy things when, you know, people want to sell. So I buy it if it's a, it started at par, I buy it at 60. So you know what she always says? She goes, why not 50? <laughs> and if I go, well, okay, I buy it at 50, why not 40? It doesn't make a difference, whatever. And that's the thing. Whenever you're buying something, it's, why weren't you able to buy it cheaper? And 
you know, it's you're able to buy it where somebody wants to sell it, and ultimately you're buying something at a price that you think is worth substantially higher. So let's talk about a purchase that's been uh, getting a lot of press that you made. Uh, there's a TV show on Showtime called Billions. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Yes. Okay. Um, and there's a great quote, and they say in that, in that show that sports franchises are how we knight people in this country. Um, talk to us about buying and now part owning the Milwaukee Bucks in the NBA. How did that happen? Um, well, it's if you can't play in the NBA, <laughs> <laughs> you would like to own a team. It's <laughs> sort of how it works. Um, you know, I had played basketball in college, thought I'd, I'd uh, make it to the NBA other than a lack of talent, which pretty much stopped me. <laughs> but what ended up happening is, uh, you know, we had, when the Bucks became available, thought that it'd be interesting if you could end up buying the team. And the main reason is um, we actually thought, or I thought we were buying a media company, not a basketball team. The contract, the TV contracts were coming up. Um, and I think most people were looking at it more as a basketball team. I thought that would be, that would be great, but as an investment, it would be something that'd be pretty unique. Um, you know, we ended up buying the team and then two years later, the TV contract tripled. And then the local contract is probably going to triple as well. So, um, you know, now the teams, I think we paid $550 million for ours. Um, at the time, the Bucks were the worst team in the league, and we paid the most for the worst franchise. And, you know, today I think all these teams are worth probably a billion and a half plus. So it's turned out to be a pretty, pretty good investment. Um, Did your mom think so? <laughs> yeah, no, it's... Um, Look, it's fun. I mean, I'm not going to tell you it's not. It's a blast to um, own a team. Um, I'll tell you a couple stories about it. It's um, after we had bought the team. Um, I was talking to one of the players, and I said to him, "Look, um, I have an interesting proposition for you. How much do we pay you?" And he goes, "Million dollars." I said, "Well, if you want, why don't you and I play one on one for double, double or nothing? If you win, I'll pay you two million. If you lose, zero." <laughs> and, you know, he looks at you kind of weird. He goes, sure. And I said, okay, here are the rules. <laughs> <laughs> All I have to do is score one point. Out of 15 tries, let's assume you're going to score, so let's not bother with that. And I just have 15 tries to score one point. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, okay. I said, well, look, just so you know, I don't want to trick you. I played in college. Um, <laughs> And he goes, right, so I don't want to trick you. I play in the NBA. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, but I only have to make one basket. He goes, right, but you're old. You're slow. And again, I play in the NBA. So, yes, let's do that. And I was, you know, he was so confident that he was going to win. I... I said, well, okay, maybe we'll do it another time. Uh, <laughs> but it's, um, it, it's a real treat, and we ended up getting lucky in that we, when we bought this team, um, we ended up, they had drafted this player, Giannis Antetokounmpo, who is turning out to be now probably one of the five best players in the NBA. Uh, so we got lucky in that, and um, it's a blast. No, it sounds like it. Um, still waiting for my invitation. The games, but I know it's no, coming. it'll no. come. No, okay. it will. At some it will. point, yeah. yeah. Okay. One day. One day, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's a very cool purchase you made domestically, but we've talked about this, and you stated that the uh, distress environment in the United States uh, isn't ideal right now, so you've gone international. Uh, a couple questions. One, what contributes to that? I think we mostly know the answer. So, where internationally are you looking, if not here? <clears throat> well, the, look, the biggest opportunities are where people are being forced to sell. Right, so Europe, huge opportunity in Europe today, simply because um, the ECB, the European Central Bank, is forcing the banks in Europe to deleverage. And so you've got a lot of structural issues that are there that we can take advantage of. So I'll give you one simple example, and it's absolutely ridiculous, but it sort of highlights why you're able to make money in Europe today. So Ireland used to have about 10 banks. And 
because of what's happened in Ireland, they now have two banks. And one of those banks that survived is Allied Irish Bank. So Allied Irish Bank used to make loans, obviously, in Ireland. Um, we ended up deciding that we're going to invest there. And really what you could do is you could make specialty loans. You could um, loan $5, $10 million to small businesses and as collateral. You'd have the real estate. Um, and you'd loan at sort of 50% to market value. So huge amount of collateral, and you'd be able to charge anywhere between 8 to 12% on that loan. Um, and with eternal leverage, you're going to generate sort of low teens returns. So we start doing this, and we decide that we need to get some leverage on this. So, and who do we get the leverage from? Allied Irish. Allied Irish Bank is not allowed to make these small loans. So Allied Irish Bank loans us money at 3%, so we can loan at 10%. It's not that big a shift to, for them to make those loans. And the reason it's not is the team that we hired to do this for us actually used to do this for Allied Irish Bank. So what you're finding is that banks today especially in Europe, because U.S. banks, and I would tell you Canadian banks, actually under Basel III have all the requisite equity capital they need, which is about 10%. What you find in Europe is the banks are still trying to meet those requirements. And as such, the ECB just forces banks to deleverage because they're worried about one thing. All they worry about is systemic risk. That's all the ECB is worried about. And what that does is it hurts small businesses because unless you have a rated loan, you can't make a loan to that business. So for firms like us, we come in and we start making those loans. And this is something that banks in the region used to lend at 3%, right? LIBOR plus two. We're doing it at three times what the rate was that those banks lent at. So you're getting massively overpaid for that risk. And the reason you are is because somebody's being forced to, they can't be in that business. So the only people who are coming into that business are going to be firms like ours. And we're not in there to try to make 3 or 4%. We're in there to make 10%. Right? And when you're in a zero rate environment, the fact that you can make 10% making a senior secured loan, you're just getting overpaid for that. Yeah. So you find that in regions um, here in the U.S., we're growing around sort of 2%. Our president will tell you we're growing huge, you know, whatever it is. You know. But it's, it's hard to have a lot of distress in the U.S. So what you have in the U.S. is special situations on the aviation side or the energy side. Europe, it's more around the continent. Right. So certainly there's a regulatory regime there. And a I can obviously empathize working at a big bank. We understand what's happened post-crisis in the financial sector. But um, do you also in your process look thematically into maybe sectors like retail that are being challenged by innovation and then also trying to take opportunities that way? Yeah. Yeah. And um, is that something that you're passionate about domestically or just more internationally on retail? No, I think we'll, yeah. do, we'll definitely do it domestically. What you're finding is you know, when you say retail, Retail is like saying, yeah, I buy stocks, right? Retail yeah, is so, so huge. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really, so all everybody goes is, is Amazon going to hurt retail? Right. right? And yes, to, in certain industries, they will. When it, when it involves pricing, Amazon will crush you. If it involves service, there's nothing Amazon can do, right? So for an experience on the retail side, luxury goods, different things, there's nothing Amazon's going to be able to do there. So what we try to do, at least on the retail side, is you know we made a big investment in Neiman Marcus, not on the equity but on the bank debt side, and our view is we're pretty comfortable on the bank debt side that what we're buying around sort of fifty cents or what we had bought around fifty cents on dollar is going to be worth substantially more than that. Um, so you've got pockets always in these industries, and in what your your job is really to try to find those pockets. Right. So. Um seeing if they have kind of a moat around them, I guess, to, to, to prevent Amazon from coming in. You've also invested in Brazil, and I think it's a waste management business, right? Is that correct? Yes. So that doesn't seem that sexy, at least not as sexy as an NBA basketball team. So you went to the other end of the spectrum right. in Brazil to invest in trash. 
Yes. Um, Why? Sorry, not maybe, sorry, literally. No, no. I don't mean figuratively. No, it's, I know. It's a trash business, right? So. Yeah, so yeah. The, here, here's the Why reason. Why is that a good thing to do? So yeah. what's hard to do is find businesses that have little competition and that will make you money. So in the US, the exact same business, and I would think it's the same thing here in Canada, in sort of developed countries, the, the same business is trade around a 10 to 12 multiple, right? So waste management, biggest business in the US, trades at a 10, 12 multiple, and grows around two, 3% a year. It's like a utility. All right, in Brazil, that same business, we're buying around a seven multiple. So 25, 30% discount. That's number one. Then number two, it's growing around 15% a year with M&A. So it's growing five times more. And then the best part about Brazil, so I don't know if anybody here is Brazilian, um, but the best part about Brazil is they just passed a law saying that now you have all these environmental factors you've got to take in consideration, which is what Canada did, which is what the US, when you're building a landfill. So 50% of trash that is in Brazil is illegally dumped. In essence, you know, build a big hole, dump it in there, and now um, you've got to do it legally. So you've got this massive growth potential that is there. And I think it's sort of a stock or a company that we're buying that um, will be worth two, three times within two or three years. I mean, it's just, you, you don't normally see that. So I think it's a phenomenal opportunity. It's probably one of the best opportunities I've ever seen. So what's the risk? Risk is really simple. It's Brazil, right? So do you want to invest in a developing country? And then the question is, are you getting paid enough for that risk? If you think, I happen to believe a company that is trading around 30% discount to the U.S., it's growing five times as fast as the U.S., and where sort of governmental um, laws are forcing people to end up following and doing legal, you know, you, you've got to have a company that's going to do the legal trash. I love that. And then the question is, am I getting paid enough for that? And I think I am. And others may say to you, well, look, it's Brazil, there's fraud, there's this, there's that. I'm like, yes, but here's the thing. People actually need their trash picked up. People get emotional when their <laughs> trash isn't picked up after three or four days. Right? Imagine if your trash isn't picked up after three or four days. What do you do? You go crazy. You call. My wife would say to me, go call. <laughs> go down there. Go make sure somebody's picking up our trash. After a week, you know, it's... It's actually a business where they've never had a default. And the reason they've never had a default is because people have to keep paying you to pick it up. So it's a pretty unique business, and I get the risk. The risk is it's Brazil, but I think we're getting paid enough for that. You also alluded to a couple other sectors you're passionate about. Uh, what are you seeing in aviation and then energy as well? So one of the things, and it goes to what I said earlier, you're either an investor or you're an asset manager. Um, what I'm seeing out there today is that in the U.S., you've got to be an investor. And what I mean by that is you've got to be in businesses that are not scalable. So the more scalable a business, the easier it is for people to come in. And then the more money that comes in, the lower the returns. The harder it is for people to come in, then the returns can stay high, just simply because it's not worth it for people to come in. So on the aviation side, we buy end-of-life planes. So we buy A330s, A320s, A340s, planes that you fly on that are 15, 20 years old. We buy those planes for like $5 million. And then we release them out. And the reason why it's a great business today is just simply because fuel costs have come down. So it's cheaper for everybody and for the airlines to keep flying those planes. Just think of it as a car, right? New car. Everybody knows the value of a new car. What would you pay for a 20-year-old car? It's like 500 bucks, $1,000, right? You're not gonna, it's just a car to get you from one place to another. You don't really worry about the fuel cost. The fact that it may do 10 miles to the gallon, you don't care because fuel is cheap. But if fuel is expensive, you're not gonna spend more on fuel than you would on the car. So right now, because fuel is $50 a barrel, it ends up being beneficial for the airlines to end up keeping to fly these older planes. So for everybody who flies, I will guarantee you, you have no idea when you get on a plane, 
that's going from Toronto to New York, whether that's a new plane or an old plane. Right? All the airlines care about right now is getting you from point A to point B and the cheapest way possible. So for us, we've got this business that's buying these planes, releasing them out, and you're making somewhere around sort of 20% plus. Well, you alluded to the price of oil. So why energy? A lot of people have gotten hurt because of the commodity fluctuations. What is right. attracting to you there? So for us, again, it's in the US, um, and same thing here in Canada, but a lot of what we're doing, and we've invested up here, um, is buying that senior secured debt. So you buy that debt, and then you spend the next two or three years crushing everybody beneath you, right? And the reason these companies can't survive is you can't survive with the amount of debt that was there when, it was, when oil was at $100 a barrel. But you can't survive when oil is at 50 if the sub debt, the unsecured debt, ends up being wiped away. And really what we do is get in the middle of that restructuring and wipe everybody out beneath us and Look, it's a fight, obviously. The goal, if you're below us, is to prolong the process, and our goal is to shorten the process. And you'll buy that debt around 50 cents on the dollar, sometimes it's 30 or 60, and restructure the company, and we'll make a pretty decent return doing that. And the good news is, every, because it's energy, everybody wants to stay away from it, yeah. right? You say to somebody, it's energy, I'm like, oh, that's not for me. Right. As opposed to where, where in energy do you want to be invested in? And we're not making an oil bet. We're saying we're buying this senior secure debt. And if oil goes to 30, that's how we get hurt. Right? I don't mind making an investment, assuming that something's got to go down 40% before I can get hurt. So if it stays at the level it's at or 10 or 20% you know, below, we're going to do exceptionally well. Right. And it's consistent with your ethos where you're going towards something where the general herd is, is moving away. Yeah. Right. And so you've talked about things you're purchasing. Anything you're selling right now, generally, or have sold in the recent past? Yeah, I mean, yeah. we sell things as, as the restrictions have worked yeah. out. We'll get out of those situations, because our goal isn't to own debt at 90 or 95. Or thematically, anything you hate right now. So I'm not going near that, because you just talked about energy. That is something that you're going yeah, to I think Is there any particular sector? Technology is hard for us. Yeah. Right? Technology to me, right yeah, so it's, just, it's yeah. great if you're yeah. an equity investor, yes. as uh, there isn't that much debt. And the last thing you want to do is buy the senior debt of a technology company that's filed for bankruptcy, because usually the market's telling you um, that nobody really cares about that technology anymore. So the value of that just has gone down dramatically. So we try to stay away from that. It's hard to talk about um, any stocks or, or any investments these days without the macroeconomic uh, you know, situation yeah. that, that we find ourselves in. And that's been that case, obviously, uh, since the crisis in, in, in very extreme forms. We've talked a lot about over the last five or six years politics. We're both very passionate about it. Maybe it's because you're a child of, uh, or you're an immigrant yourself. I'm a child of immigrants, so we have a lot of passion for, for this country. Um, and you've gotten involved uh, on the Democratic side and cultivated a, a friendship with the Clintons. I think you first met President Clinton back in the 90s yeah. when he was president. Um, but that relationship has evolved uh, over time. Uh, what are some of your experiences uh, that you can share, obviously, in this forum uh, with that relationship? Um, you know, it's... I. I think President Clinton, I, I've had the opportunity to travel with him and you get to meet all these world leaders. Um, it's, it's actually pretty unique, but uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple examples. So I can do his voice really well. So if you close your eyes, you'll think it's President Clinton. Um, so he calls me up one day and he goes, hey, Mark, <laughs> I'm going to Buckingham Palace and I'm going to have dinner with the Queen. I was wondering if you'd like to come along. I go, yeah, Mr. President, that'd be You like that, That's right? Good. So I go, yeah, Mr. President, that would be great. And he goes, oh, that's great. Listen, we just need your plane. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, yeah, I don't care. Um, all right, so, you know, you go to the, you go to the Middle East and you, you get to meet all these world leaders. So I'll give you a couple situations. We, um, um, we're, we're, first, we're, we, we went to Davos, and um, we're in Davos, and everybody wants to talk to President Clinton, and um, he's got this private meeting with uh, Putin. And, you know, I'm there, I'm sort of sitting at the table, but I'm at the end. 
And after the meeting, um, as we're about to leave, I go, hey, Mr. President, uh, do you think I could get a picture with uh, Putin? I don't think I'll ever meet him, and this would be really cool. And he goes, oh, yeah. So he goes, Vladimir. <laughs> he goes, come here, Mark wants a picture. <laughs> and Putin <laughs> doesn't move. <laughs> right? He's like, you, know, you just see him stone-faced. He's not budging. So I'm thinking to myself, all right, I guess no picture. So President Clinton goes, that's okay, we'll come to you. <laughs> and we just go to him and, you know, you got this picture. And you got this picture with Putin's like, <laughs> like, all right. So, you know, we then continue on. We go off to the Middle East and we're in Bahrain and we have all these meetings. You meet literally all these people. So this is on the same trip. So we're in Bahrain. And we're coming back, uh, we're going to the airport, and um, the king of Bahrain says, hey, Mr. President, is there anything you need? And the president goes, oh, I forgot to go shopping. I got to get something for Hillary. So the king goes, ah, oh, no problem. You know, we'll, uh, we'll have you stop off at our, you know, the most luxurious mall that we have on the way to the airport. And literally, like, you know, half an hour later, we're at the mall, and, like, the Bahrain army is there to make sure there's no issues. And the mall is closed down, and we're there. And as we go in, the king uh, says he's got stuff he's got to go do. And he goes, um, but Mr. President, whatever you want, a gift from my country to you, anything you want in the mall, it's yours. And you know, I'm there and a couple of other people. And he goes, and whatever your friends want, it's our gift from us to you. I'm like, oh, that's great. <laughs> um, so um, I go in the mall, and I go to the most expensive watch store. Um, <laughs> so why not? I'm never going to see the king again. Uh, <laughs> what do I care? So uh, I, take, I get, find this Patek Philippe that's like 100000 And I run back to the president. I go, sir, what do you think of this watch? He goes, oh, I love that. <laughs> I go, it's, it's a lot. It's 100000 He goes, ooh, that might be a lot. <laughs> I goes, you think I should return? He goes, yeah. So I run back. Now I get a $50,000 watch. Right? I have no idea. I bring back. I, look, I show it to the president. I go, what do you think? He goes, how much? I go, 50000 He goes, I don't think he's going to care. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yes. <laughs> so, you know, get a great watch. Off we go. Um, all right, so that's Bahrain. <laughs> then we go to, now we next go to Saudi Arabia. So we meet with uh, King Abdullah. And... You know, you have this great, uh, I mean, you're in the palace. I mean, it's like, literally, you're meeting every world leader, so you're in the palace. And, um, you know, the king is introducing the president. He goes, I've met every world leader. I just want to say you're the, you're the most, you're the smartest person. You're the best person. I mean, couldn't have been, like, a nicer introduction, right? I mean, I would have liked that introduction, right? Before I come up, the best person you're ever going to meet. I mean, it just goes on and on for, like, 10 minutes. Right? The president gets, gets up, and I'm thinking, oh, I wonder what he's going to say about King Abdullah. Right? And he gets up, and he just goes, well, I just want you to know, you're my favorite king. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Right? That was the introduction to the king. Yeah. All right, end of the trip, so last story. We now go to Kuwait, and we have our meetings with the emir and everybody. And as we're leaving... As we're leaving, um, you know, you've got the, and, and all, there's like so much pomp and circumstance and there's these red carpets and everything. And um, as we're walking to the plane, I go to the president, hey, you know what, I, I gotta run back, I gotta use the bathroom. And the president says, well, there's one on the plane. I go, yeah, it's complicated. So run back and I come back, like it's literally like three, four minutes. And I see my plane is taxiing. <laughs> yeah, it's moving, it's slow, but it's moving slow. So I'm like, what the hell? So I start running after the plane. Yeah, you gotta remember, like, Secret Service has taken your passport, they've taken your everything. I've got no identification. Last thing you wanna be is a Jewish guy in Kuwait <laughs> with no ID, running after a plane. <laughs> so I'm running after the plane, stop, stop, stop. And I hear in the background, stop, stop, stop. And finally, the plane stops, and you know, all of us start walking the plane. The, the stairs come down. The the president looks, you know, comes down the stairs, and you know, I've got like half the Kuwaiti army behind me because they thought I'm like attacking the plane. 
And the um, president looks at me and goes, should have seen your face. <laughs> 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 you really thought we were gonna go? <laughs> like it's not funny. <laughs> and he goes, "Oh, it was hilarious." <laughs> so we get on the plane. I look at my pilots. I'm like, "What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> what are you guys doing?" Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how president said yeah. to go. Oh, we thought it'd be kind of funny, and yeah. I was like, "Seriously?" <laughs> and yeah, we're on the plane. Yeah, the president's having a great time. It's like. Oh, you're so funny running after the plane. <laughs> so that, that was our trip. I mean, it's, it was a great trip. Thank you for sharing that. That's, those are great stories. And um, obviously, you saw firsthand uh, a very you know, volatile part of the world. Yeah. Uh, continues to be. Um, as Mo mentioned, you're a member of the uh, Council on Foreign Relations. Um, I'm too, thanks to you, so thank you for that. Um, and through that organization, you do get a lot of exposure to what's going on in the world. So what is keeping you up at night right now geopolitically? Uh, markets remain very sanguine despite what's happening. And uh, just to add a bit of a domestic uh, point of view as well, um, my former boss, John Corzine, is going to talk in a bit. He's more bullish on tax reform or tax cuts happening than I am. Uh, if that doesn't get done, which seems like a you know, an issue more and more every day, uh, is that going to have an effect on markets? It will. I think, I think markets, um, things have gone up quite a bit out of anticipation that um, Congress was going to be able to do a lot of things. They haven't. And, but what you have is sort of a view that this administration is pro-business, which it is. Uh, but look, it, I'll give everybody here a great trade idea, all right? And there's no risk to it, or very, very small risk. So think of this. There's a country called North Korea. You may have heard of it. And that country is threatening nuclear war with the United States and is threatening nuclear war with South Korea or you know, conventional weapons with South Korea. Do you know where the sovereign debt of South Korea trades at? It trades 10 basis points higher than US treasuries. All right, so right now, you can either buy a US treasury or you can say, you know what? I wanna make 10 bips more. One minute? Okay, yeah, one minute. One minute. I, can, I, wanna, I am so interested in yield that for an extra 10 bips, I'm going to buy South Korean sovereign debt. So do you think, so what's the risk there? Let's say there's a bit of an issue in South Korea. I guarantee you that sovereign debt shoots up. What's the worst that happens? It tightens to U.S. treasuries. So you're going to, your worst case is you lose 10 bips. And your best case is you probably make two, three, four times your money. Now, do I think there's going to be an issue with North Korea? No. But by the way, the insurance for that, I would have thought the markets would have told you that there's a bigger risk. And that, that's really what's going on. The, the search for yield, that's, that, that's right? What everybody is looking for is how am I making money? Because you're in a zero rate environment. And that today, there is so much capital out there. It's a little bit of what all the speakers have talked about that there's so much capital that people are being forced to do irrational things. And I happen to think South Korean sovereign debt is massively irrational just from all the news that goes, I mean, we're all reading the same news. So why is, why is the risk only 10 bips? And it's because people need that yield. And that's what's happening around the world, right? So what you've got to do as investors is actually find areas where people are being forced to sell. And that you've got managers who, are do, who can do that in a really good, in a good way. Like, so Cliff, who was here earlier, I happen to think is one of the smartest people I've ever met, right? And knows his stuff and actually understands risk. And that's what you need from people is, it's, it's a risk. Like, if I come and I tell you, look, I'm up 20%. And the person who follows after me, he's up 18 you know, most people are gonna go, look, I'll invest with Mark, he's up 20, the other guy was only up 18. All right, well, the guy who was up 18, 
did it on unlevered. Let's say I did it with 10 times leverage. So really I'm making two, but it looks like I've made 20. And you've got to, as investors, actually drill down and try to see where people are making those returns. That's sort of why when we stay out in Europe, we're trying to make unlevered returns at 10%. Energy is making you unlevered returns somewhere between 10 or 15. In Asia today, you can make large returns doing direct lending because people are being forced to, they need to borrow money. And it costs them, nobody's lending them that money because China and everybody else is pulling back. And yet people believe their equity is worth so much, they're willing to pay you 15, 20%. But if I say to you, investing in Asia, you get nervous and go, well, it's Asia, the legal system isn't that great. But then I go, it's Australia, and it's Hong Kong, and it's Singapore. It's where the legal system is actually really strong. So I think the challenge for everybody is trying to find the people who can do that. And I would tell you, it's hard to do that on a scale. It's easier to do smaller, um, because that's where the returns are. I don't want to compete against Blackstone. I don't want to compete against BlackRock. Right? I need to compete against people who in essence don't want to go into that market. And what we try to do is find around the world where you can do that. Ladies and gentlemen, the best, most smartest guy, my favorite hedge fund manager, Mark Lazary. Thank you very much.